And with that, I think I'm going to, this really is a good setup to it because what I'm gonna share with you today is all predicated upon an individual who didn't drop the mic, who recognized the opportunity, who was willing to evolve as a person and go through the transformation that was necessary for his time and redefine how he saw himself. I'm talking about Nehemiah, and I want you to go to Nehemiah chapter two, verse one through 10, and there you will find our study of the word of God today. Are y'all ready for some word in this place? If you're ready for some word, make some noise. Yeah, yeah. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said, don't drop the mic. I said to the king, may the king live forever. He knew how to talk to him. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to him, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams. He started asking for everything, didn't he? So, he? so that he can make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the reference and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letter. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite officials heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Can you say amen? I want to use a subject this morning, living bigger than me. Living bigger than me. Let's pray while we're standing. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I pray that what you've invested in me would be imparted into them that there would be a transference of revelation, of knowledge, of understanding, of your will and your word for such a time as this. I believe you to do it. Have your way, great God that you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Every believer everywhere said amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. So I'm gonna start, I sit for a minute, I'm sit with you. So recently lost a very, very dear friend of mine Lost, had a conversation with him the night before he passed. Many of you know Holloway Gray passed away. The last night, the last night that we talked on the phone, we had this amazing conversation. And I was telling him about it. I had told him before, but it came up again. How as you get older, one of the things that gives you a feeling of feeling good about where you are in life is that you didn't waste your youth. And I said, Holloway, we got so much to be proud of. We didn't waste our youth. 
We didn't waste our strength. We didn't waste our energy just living to ourselves, doing our own thing, paying the bills, making the rent and bringing in the groceries and going home. We got outside of the box and changed lives and touched people and reached around the world and did something that was beyond ourselves. And it gave us a feeling of gratification and a feeling of a life well lived. Never in my wildest dreams did I realize this would be my last conversation with him. The reason I broached the subject with him though is because I recognize that we are living in such a, a me society. It's me, it's all about me. Selfies, thousands of pictures of me. Everything is about me. My feelings, my needs, what I want, what I feel. You didn't treat me right. Every, every, everything is about me. And two, when two me's get married, you got a mess. You got a real mess because she's talking about herself, he's talking about himself, and the me syndrome goes on and on and on, and people never evolve into becoming who they should be because they never get beyond living for themselves. If you hire somebody like that, they can't get along with anybody. The moment they get their feelings hurt, they lose their mission because their feelings got hurt. They lose their assignment because their feelings got hurt. They lose their calling because their feelings got hurt. They sit around and pout and become obnoxious because their feelings got hurt. You know why? Because we're in a narcissistic society where everything is about them. It's about me. I can't be loyal because it's about me. I can't be dependable because it's about me. I can't sacrifice because it's about me. I got a voice, but I won't sing because I don't feel like coming out on Thursday night because it's about me. I've got a message, but I won't give it because I don't like being in front of my people. It's about me. Everything is about me. I would go after this other job. I'm going to stay on this job because it's about me. I got kids, but I don't want to be bothered with them because they get on my nerves. It's about me. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I have never seen anything like this. People who have kids and don't want to be bothered with them. Now, there might be some times that they got on your nerves, but you still got to hang in there because you got to know that in order to be a mother, it's a sacrifice. Quit looking at some cute guy and say, I want to be your, your, I want you to be my daddy. What is it, my da baby daddy? I want you to be my baby daddy. No, 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 no. When he gets through being cute, you still got that kid. You got to want the kid, not the daddy. You got to want the kid because that's a lifelong experience. If you're a man, quit looking at the woman. She's gorgeous. I want you to have my baby. After she had the baby, I want you to take care of that baby. I want you to get a job. I want you to make some pay. I want you to bring some bread and some food up in this mug. We got to get rid of this me syndrome that's killing us. It is destroying us. It is destroying our ministry. People who are preaching now are not preaching for the crowd or for the people or for the benefit of the people. They're preaching for themselves. What's in it for me? You cannot serve God and be a Christian, not a real Christian, and be stuck on stupid and tied into yourself and refuse to evolve to the degree that you understand this is about sacrifice. This is about service. This is about giving yourself away. This is about pouring out your energy and going where you've never gone before and living for a purpose, for living bigger than me. I want to live big. I want to live big. I want to live big. Type that in the timeline. I want to live big. I'm through living small. I'm not going to let the devil talk me into living small. I'm going to live big. I'm going to live big because I'm living around so many people that are dying. And the more people die, the more it makes me want to live big. I don't want to waste a week. I don't want to waste a day. I don't want to waste an hour. I don't want to waste a second. I want to live big. That's why I'm not going to let you get on my nerves because I want to live big. That's why I'm not going to let you frustrate me because I want to live big. That's why I don't care what you think about me, because I want to live big. I want to live big. I want to live so big that I live for something that is bigger than myself. In our text today, we have Nehemiah. He is neither a prophet, nor priest, nor king. He's just somebody working a job. The, the, the book of Nehemiah begins in such a way 
that it introduces this character to us who leaps at us almost without warning from a position of working a nine to five. He's got a grind, he's got a job, he's doing his own thing, it's cool. He's set up, he's working in a nice place, he's got everything together. Let me explain to you how Nehemiah comes to have his job. He undoubtedly was born during the time that Israel was in captivity up under the Babylonian captivity. The Babylonians had taken Jerusalem and destroyed it. And you've heard me preach before about how they left in chains. And if I forget Jerusalem, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. You've heard me preach before about the sacrifices they went through. Well, then they did go through those sacrifices. Babylon ripped them away from their home. But guess what? You reap what you sow. The same Babylon that tore things up for them got overcome by the Persian army and now the Babylonians are out of power and the children of Israel have been released to go back home and some of them have stayed. Nehemiah is one of the ones that has stayed. He is now working for King Artaxerxes. King Artaxerxes is a Persian king. He's a new ruler, he's a new emperor, and Nehemiah is his cupbearer, and he's now in a position of authority, and he's now in a position of power, and he has Nehemiah as a cupbearer. Now, that doesn't make Nehemiah a waiter. It doesn't make him a busboy. It doesn't make him just somebody who's going to and fro. That means that everything that the, every time the king drinks wine, Nehemiah tastes the wine before the king to make sure it was safe. So Nehemiah is used to danger. I'm not trying to tell you that he's a wino. I'm not trying to tell you he's a drunk. I'm assuming that you understand that one of the proclivities of the Persian governments was to kill or to do a coup on a king by poisoning him and to circumvent the possibility that the king might be poisoned. It was Nehemiah's job that if there was anything bad in the cup, he took it first. I want you to understand the mentality of the guy that came from, because your destiny is always hidden in your history. Y'all didn't hear what I was saying. Your destiny, if you go back in your life, you will see certain things that prepared you for where you are right now. If you go back in your life, you'll see things that don't even seem related to what you're doing right now, but have served you well now that you're in the place that you're in right now, because now Nehemiah is in a situation where he faces death every day. Every morning he goes to work, he knows it could be his last morning. He has already begun to have the roots of living beyond himself. I wouldn't want Nehemiah's job. I might give it to the cat. And if the cat don't make it, then I say, King, don't drink this wine, it's not good. I would not want to be Nehemiah's job because if Nehemiah went to work one morning and somebody was poisoned in the king, the evidence of saving the king would cost him his life. This is a seed of unselfishness that is planted in him from the earliest of his existence. Parents, hear me well. If you don't plant quality, don't plan to reap quality in adults. If you don't plant the seeds of unselfishness, if you don't plant the seeds of courage, if you don't plant the seeds in them where they learn not to be selfish and they learn to share and they learn that everything is not about them and it's not about what you want and it's not about you like a Chuck E. Cheese. We're going this place today. We'll go that place another. I know that sounds like little bitty things, but it's the, the root work of creating a certain type of person that they don't think that the whole world evolves around their wishes. The reason we have so many divorces today is because you think the whole world evolves around your wishes. And if you don't find somebody who evolves around your wishes, you're ready to get out because you're not willing to live beyond yourself. Come on and talk to me, somebody. Type in the comments, I want to live bigger than me. I didn't come here to live and die just to pay the mortgage on a house I'm going to leave. I didn't come here just to pay the rent 
For somebody who's a homeowner and I made my payments and my credit is good, that's great. And I lived here and then I died. That was it. That's all you're going to do is live for some clothes in your closet and some red on the bottom of your shoes. You could get some paint and paint red on the bottom of your shoes. You're living all of your life for stuff you're going to leave. What are you doing that is beyond you? Take a minute and think about it. I don't want to bring your joy down. I don't want to make you feel bad. But, but, but what, would, what would people lose if they lost you? How are you affecting the life of somebody other than you and yours? When God gives you gifts, do you think he gave you the gift for you? If God gave you a voice to sing, did, do you think he gave you the voice for you to sing in the shower? Whatever God gave you, he gave it to you to affect somebody beyond yourself. You have to realize this. And Nehemiah and his introduction to us is already learning to live his life beyond himself. The king already understood the king's father had been poisoned. Nehemiah had faced death every day. It was clear to him. He understood quite clearly what was going on in his life. And while he has decided to stay behind and not go back to Israel and not go back to Jerusalem, he has not lost his compassion for Jerusalem. Now watch this. In the previous chapter, somebody has come to him on his job and said, have you heard about back home? Everybody that went back home, they're back home, but things are not cool. They're back home and they're living there and they're doing the best they can, but the whole place is in ruins. The houses have collapsed. The economy is poor. The people are struggling. And the walls of Jerusalem lay in ruins. The gates have been burned with fire and everything has been destroyed. Now the person who told him, told him and walked away. But Nehemiah could not get out of his head that he was supposed to do something about that. Isn't it amazing how both of us can be exposed to the same information? It bothers one person and it doesn't bother another person at all. It's almost like somebody living in a messy room. Some people are happy in a messy room. It doesn't bother them to be in a messy room, but it drives you crazy to be in a messy room. See, the things that drive you crazy are the things you have the power to change. If you've been looking for your purpose, look at, look at your passions. Not just what you like, but what you don't like. What you can't stand to see is a clue, not that they should do something, but that you should do something. Now, Nehemiah has nothing to do with it. He's set for life. He works for the king. He doesn't work for the cobbler making shoes. He doesn't work for the carpenter. He doesn't work for the coppersmith. This boy working for the king. And he goes on a fast and stops eating because he is worried about something bigger than him. I don't care whether you're 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, 60 years old, 10 years old, until you have been worried about something bigger than you, you have not lived yet. Until your prayer life has gone beyond you and your four and no more, you are not an intercessor. You're not a prayer warrior if all you care about is you until you have gone to bed troubled about something that you didn't see how in the world you were going to fix, but it bothered you. You're not living. You're just existing. Nehemiah is troubled where other people are comfortable. You want to know what makes people great? It's when you are troubled by what makes other people comfortable. I never will forget one day I came in and we had a staff meeting and it was not a good one. It was not a good one. I very seldom fly off the handle, but it was really not a good one. And I remember one of the things I said to them, I said, I'm angry and I'm angry because you're not. 
Because if you had been angry, I wouldn't have to be angry. The only reason I have to be angry is because you saw it and you remained indifferent about something that I think is extremely important. What moves you? What, what do you value? What will you fight for? What will you put yourself at risk for? If you can't answer that, you have not lived. John Lewis answered that. Dr. King answered that. Mahatma Gandhi answered that. Mandela answered that. All of our heroes are heroes because they were living for something bigger than themselves. Everybody worth talking about, every name you ever want to mention that really shook the world or shook the neighborhood or shook the community or even shook their child did it because they were living for something bigger than themselves. Nehemiah was troubled and he was upset and he was disturbed in his spirit. And it, now it has gotten to the point that when he comes before the king, he has fasted so and become so sad that the king says, you're not sick, but why do you look so sad? What troubles you to the point that it's noticeable? What troubles you, disturbs you, does it matter to you? Does it matter to you? Does it matter that people are dying? Does it matter that people are suffering? I know these seem like simple questions, but today we have to ask these questions because we're living in a society today that doesn't seem to care even that hundreds of thousands of people are dead. You can no longer assume human compassion. We are living in the last days and the Bible said that the love of many will wax cold. One of the reasons that we have such coldness is because we're living in the last days. That coldness, the, 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 the loss of natural affections is a sign of the end time. The fact that people can see somebody shot down in the street and keep on eating their lunch. The fact that you can have a seizure in the city and people walk past you because they got to get to work is a sign that something is wrong with our society. What has happened to us? That we are not moved with other people's pain and their problems. Nehemiah was touched by the feeling of their infirmity. Not only was he touched by it, because we're often touched by a lot of things, but we don't always do something about the things we've been touched by. Nehemiah was touched to the point of action. Don't tell me you care if you can't back it up with what you do. Oh, don't have love for me if I don't get it. Don't be concerned about me if you didn't call me. I want to be able to see a correlation between what you care about and what you are doing or you're just living for yourself. I want to see you go out of your way for somebody other than you. I want to see you sacrifice for something where you don't get a reward for it. You just think it's important and you're willing to sow into it. I want you to care enough about something that you put something on the line to say, I'm a bigger person. I'm bigger than that. I'm too big to live this small. I'm too big to live in a cage of comfort and never do anything with my life that shakes the world. I'm living for something that's bigger than me. And he goes before the king, and the king notices that his countenance has fallen, and the Bible said he was a friend. And he had a right to be a friend, because history says that this particular king had killed his brother to get the position. He didn't take any foolishness. The king asked him, why do you look sad? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And he says, I was very much a friend. I was scared. You don't run up on the king just any kind of way. 
good God. All of a sudden I realized that Nehemiah isn't working for the king alone. He's not working for the wine alone. He has been positioned for purpose. Write this down because this is for somebody. Somebody I'm preaching to, you think you're there for the job. You think you're in that city, in that country, in that place for just to be there. But God has positioned you for purpose. That's why you don't move every time somebody says something to get on your nerve. Because sometimes God didn't put you there for the wine. He put you there for the influence. Can't you suffer anything? God had put him in a place that he was kin to the Jews, but he worked for the Persians, which made him bilingual enough that he knew how to talk to the king and he knew how to talk to his own people. In my book, when I talk about you understanding your crowd, you can have the same message, but you change the language depending upon the audience, and your world will be no bigger than your ability to adapt your language to your audience. Nehemiah knew how to talk to the king. He starts a conversation off with the king. Oh, king, live forever. He wanted to know, I'm on your side, king. By the way, my people are in trouble. He knew how to approach him. He had been positioned for purpose. And I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning, but the Lord sent me here to tell you, you've been positioned for purpose. Stop complaining about the temperature. Your desk is too small. They don't recognize you. They didn't print your name. God put you there for purpose when the time is right. <laughs> When the time is right, God's going to use you to influence and to make a change and to make a difference. You can get paid anywhere. God didn't send you there to get paid. He sent you there to make changes. He sent you there to make a difference. He sent you there how to, how to, to learn another language, another protocol, another methodology, another culture, an ability so that he can use you in an ambidextrous sort of way so that you wouldn't be so limited. Some of you need to come out of your cocoon. You've been in your safety zone so long that you're about to asphyxiate. God wants to put you into a place that scares you and a place where you're careful what you say and a place you have to study to be ready for so that you can evolve. If you ever get exposed to greatness and go back home to weakness, you won't even feel at home anymore. It will change you when you hear what they're talking about. When you hear their conversation, you used to think it's funny, now you think it's irrelevant because God has put you, positioned you for purpose. He planted Nehemiah there. God knew that he was going to need a man on the inside. And he planted him right there. And when the time was right, he troubled him. And when he troubled him bad enough, he went in to see the king. And he said, king, my, my, the land of my, how can I be happy when the land of my ancestors is suffering. The land of my ancestors, he had to say, because he had never really been there. In order for him to be young enough to do what he did, he had to be born in captivity, as they were in captivity for 70 years. But he still had respect for where he came from. I could spend all night on that. I'm not even, I'm scared to even touch any of that right there. He had respect for where he came from. He wasn't neutralized by his faith so that he saw everybody in a uniform sort of way. He understood where he came from and he was there without denying his heritage. Don't let nobody give you their Jesus at the expense of losing your heritage. It's the difference between me teaching Christ and teaching culture. You don't have to give up your culture to accept Christ. 
You can be your culture. You can wear your hair. You can put on your clothes like you want. You can eat what you want to eat and still be a Christian. And when people start teaching you their culture instead of their Christianity, they have a hidden agenda. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? And there he is in this situation, and he knows he has to do something. And the king asked him, he says, if I have found favor in thy sight, O king, I need you to allow me to go back and to change my people. And God had given him favor with the king of Persia. Good God Almighty. Next point, God's about to give you favor. God's about to give you favor with somebody that you don't even have a right to have favor with, not connected to. Do you not know sometimes God will give you more favor with people you're not related to? Oh, y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Than the people you are related to. God will use somebody to bless you that is unexpected. And the people you thought would help you when you got in trouble won't help you at all. And somebody way out here from left field will come in with your blessing. Somebody's got your blessing. Oh my God. Type that on the line. Somebody's got your blessing. Just because you don't have the money to do the job and just because you don't have the wood to build the building and just because you don't have the resources and just because you don't have the degree to do what you're trying to do, God will use somebody to underwrite your blessing. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nehemiah didn't give up and say, I can't do nothing about it, I don't have the money. Nehemiah himself didn't have the money, but God will fund your vision with his provision. Oh God, I'm preaching way better than you shout. God will, if, if the vision be of God, why would God give you the vision and then not give you the provision? God gave Nehemiah the vision and then he gave him access to the provision. And the king asked him, and this, this sounds like it's not a hard question to answer, but I have had this question asked to me before, and it is a difficult question for certain personality types to be able to answer. The king answered him, asked him a question, and said, what do you want? Sometimes the hardest question to answer when you've been a self-reliant person all your life and you've never been taught to lean on anybody, it's difficult to open your mouth to really say, well, especially when what you want is expensive. It's one thing if I want to stick a chewing gum. It's another thing if I need a half a million dollars. The king asked him, what do you want? But look at who asked him. The king asked him, what do you want? The king is used to talking big talk. Oh, God. You can't be no king and not used to talking big talk. So the big talking king asked him, what do you want? And because Nehemiah has been raised in an environment that he never had to pay for, because that's what favor is. Favor enables you to enjoy that which you didn't have to labor for. Favor brings you to a table that you didn't have to buy. Favor feeds you food that you didn't have to get at the grocery store. Favor opens up a door and brings you before people you could have never met on your own. Favor gives you this unearned, undeserved access to a realm of influence. He couldn't have got no appointment with the king. He's having a big conversation with a big king, and he's got to have a big faith to respond to this question. And the question for you this Sunday morning is what do you want? What's it gonna take to bring a smile back on your face? 
What's it going to take for you to live your life with purpose? What do you want? Do you know what you want? Or are you just complaining? The king was used to solving problems. So he says, what is it that you want? And the first thing Nehemiah did was pray. He didn't even answer him without praying. I know he said, oh God, I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> Let me get this right. And then he starts answering the king. And he starts to tell him, he said, I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. So he's asking for some time off. And then the king, then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked him, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? And it pleased the king to send him. So I set a time. So while the door was open, since you're going to give me the time off, by the way, I was wondering if you could give me a letter for the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they would provide me safe conduct. And by the way, can I have a few soldiers to go with me on the journey? And, and you know, when I get back home, I'm going to need some wood. So I need you to underwrite my vision. Oh, y'all ain't shouting. If y'all believe this word, this word ought to be a sign to you that somebody's got the wood you need, somebody's got the security that you need, somebody's got the help that you need, somebody's got everything. Made me think of that song, If You Want It, God's Got It. He's got everything you need. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God sent me to stir your faith this morning. He's got everything that you need. And this guy who is a servant in the house ends up with security, letters from the king, access to the king's forest, he got enough wood to rebuild all the gates that had been set on fire. And the king paid the bill and his salary. And he said, by the way, I need enough wood for my house. So the king built him a house. If God asks you, what do you want? Do you have an answer? Some of y'all don't even know how much you need. I need some money. What is that? I could give you 50 cents. I could give you a quarter. I could give you the, I need some, you don't even know how far in debt you are. You don't know what it takes for you to be out. You, you don't even, you haven't even gotten an answer to the question. But Nehemiah knew that the king was only being nice to him because he says it this way, because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Oh God, if I was talking to some people of faith this morning, they would shout the hand of God is on me. The hand of my God is on me. The hand of my God, I can tell the hand of God is on me because he made you like me. When the hand of God is on your life, he'll make your enemies your footstool. When the hand of God is on your life, he will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Somebody ought to shout, his hand is on me. Good God Almighty, his hand is on me. 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 I don't understand it, but his hand is on me. It always has been. For all of my life, God's hand has been on my life. As far back as I can remember, the hand of God was on my life. It was on me when I was right. It was on me when I was wrong. It was on me when I was weak. 
it was only when I was strong, but the reason my enemies couldn't kill me was the hand. Hand of God, the 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 hand of God. Stop the cancer, stop the disease, stop the plague, stop the enemy, stop the curse, stop the bondage, stop the virus, the hand of the Lord. Nehemiah knew that the graciousness that was extended to him by the king came from God. God's going to use other people to bless you. But he's not going to use other people to bless you when your vision is only you. God is not going to give you the king's ransom when all you want is about you. God underwrote the budget because Nehemiah was living bigger than me. He wanted to do something that was bigger than him. And wherever vision goes, provision will get right in behind it. It'll get right in behind it. It might not walk with it. You might not have to have a vision first that you can't pay for. But if you look over your shoulder, goodness and mercy are following you all the days of your life. Provision, look over your shoulder. Provision is right over your shoulder. Ha! Can I go deeper with this text? Because I want you to get this text. Better still, the Holy Spirit wanted you to get this text. The reason God got you up to hear this message is that God wants you to get this text. He wants you to understand that he's already got the bill paid for. He's already raised the trees that are going to be the gates to the city. He's already made the way. Now you got to be courageous. You got to be courageous. Because it's one thing to be dealing with a cup of wine. And it's another thing to be dealing with a den of thieves. God's getting ready to take you to the next level. And every time you go to the next level, you go to the next devil. <laughs> you, can't, you can't get more without getting more. <laughs> more house means more payments. <laughs> means more insurance, means more taxes, means more options, means more rooms, means more bathtubs, means more bathrooms, may mean a, more swimming pools, but more means more. Means you're going to have more breakdown, more plumbing, more this, more that, that. You can't get more of what you want if you're not prepared to deal with more of what you don't want. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Somebody type that more means more. You can't get more of this and not have more of that. If you get a car, you're going to need a garage. If you need a garage, you're going to have to have some oil. If you have some oil, you got to have some gas. More means more. Think it not strange that these fiery trials have come upon you. You know why fiery trials have come upon you? Because you got more. To him whom much is given, much is required. You can't have much given and little required. Now he has to go right into the enemy's camp and face him. One man fighting for a whole nation. Odds against him. And the reason that he's gone is because Jerusalem lay in ruins. The walls had all been broken down and the gates had all been burned. The sheep gate 
and the Dungate, where all the systems that supported their life. The sheep went out one gate, the dung went out the other gate. They had a place to do everything, but all the gates had been burned with fire. And the walls, all the walls had been torn down. The Bible says when Nehemiah got to Jerusalem, that he rested for three days. It was such a journey to get there. He rested for three days. And then by night, while the guards were asleep, Curtis, he snuck away from his security and went out by night by himself to inspect the wall. Now this is where it gets good. When he went out to inspect the walls by night, the walls all lay in ruins. And you know what your problem has been? Your walls lay in ruin. Do you think I'm really preaching about Jerusalem? The Bible says a man that cannot rule his own spirit is like a city without walls. If you cannot control you, it's not that you're a bad person. It's not that you're evil. It's not that you're wicked. It's not even that you're weak. It's that your walls are torn down. What is a city without walls? In the Bible days, walls were your defense. It defined who you were. You were defined by your boundaries. Boundaries aren't what you do. Boundaries are what you won't do. <laughs> oh, this is so good. This is so good. This is so good. I start to say this and preach it somewhere. Boundaries are defined by what you won't do. And you've lost your boundaries. That's how he climbed in. That's how he climbed into your life. You're not silly. Your walls are down. That's how she took the money. She got your money because your walls were down. Your walls determine your strength. A man that cannot rule his own spirit, cannot control his own tongue, cannot control his own anger, cannot rule his own body, is like a city without walls. And here Nehemiah teaches us not only the danger of losing your walls, because see, when you, when you lose your walls, anything can get out and anything can get in. And I want to know, what is accessing you? Depression and fear and anger and low self-esteem and doubt and dread and moodiness and anger and hostility and intimidation and insecurity. You didn't inherit that. It got in because you don't have walls. It got in because you didn't say no. And all of this text is about the importance of boundaries. You can have a friend, but you got to have... <laughs> you can eat, but you got to have some... <laughs> Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? In any area that you're being defeated, you're being defeated because in that area, your walls are torn down. This might be the most important message you will ever hear this year. Because none of us wants to be defeated. Sam Ballad and Tobiah and all of them were Samaritans. And they were, were Assyrians. And they had come over because they were taking advantage of Jerusalem. Because the walls were down. What is taking advantage of you because your walls are torn down? How, wait, can I go deep? I need some time this morning. How, how did my walls get torn down? 
you know that last big fight you had? You, you know that last big fight? That last emotional upheaval? That last loved one that died? That last relationship that fell apart? She didn't just get the couch in the refrigerator. She tore down your walls. You didn't just lose your daddy. It tore down your walls. And now, Jerusalem has come back home. And they are back home. And they are back to worshiping. And they have built Zerubbabel's temple. And they're back to praising God. But they are praising God without walls. Somebody listening at me, it's not that you don't love Jesus, you love Jesus. It's not that you don't read your Bible, you read your Bible. It's not that you don't love the Word, you're listening at me right now. But you are praising God in a city that has no walls. So you can sing the songs of Zion and still be suicidal. because you have no walls. And God has sent this word this morning because brick by 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 brick, God is gonna rebuild your walls. You ought to shout right there. Give him three minutes of crazy praise. Crazy praise. Crazy praise, 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 crazy praise. I never will forget I had the hardest time learning to save money. Corey, I couldn't save money to save my life. I, I go out there and make money look like everything just went through my hands like water. I had to pray about it. I had to really use my spiritual weapons against my economy. At first I was praying, God, give me more and more and more. And he gave me more and I still didn't have nothing. And he said, now what? You was broke with nothing and you're still broke with something. So it's not the amount I'm giving you. You have no walls. He said, if you build walls, if you resist urges, if you develop discipline, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you won't have room enough to receive. But I will not be complicit in your dysfunction. Oh, y'all ain't shouting now. He said, T.D. Jakes, I want to use you in a mighty way. You're pastoring in the woods right now, but I got a place for you in Dallas, but I can't send you to Dallas because you don't have no walls. If you don't learn how to have walls in Montgomery, you won't have walls in Dallas. If you don't have walls with 30 members, you won't have walls with 30,000. And he said, so before I can bless you any further, I got to send a Nehemiah spirit. Yeah, type it in the comments. A Nehemiah spirit is coming into my life. A rebuilding spirit is coming into my life. A reconstruction is coming into my life. A replacement of priorities is coming in my life. A new priority is coming in my life. New boundaries are coming into my life. I am going to build back the walls that left me vulnerable. When Sam Bilen heard about it, he went crazy. He said, oh no, don't build back the walls. Hell gets nervous when you start talking about building walls. Demons start trembling when you start talking about building walls. Witches get nervous when you start building walls. Because the only way they could access you 
It's because your walls are torn down. Nehemiah goes out by night. He dips out by night. And he, he views the city. He viewed it. How bad is that? All of that is burned out. He did a damage assessment analysis. <laughs> right now with your 30-year-old self, right now with your 45-year-old self, let's do a damage assessment analysis. Let's not live in denial. Let's not close our eyes. Let's not call wrong right and right wrong. Let's take an honest damage assessment analysis. Where should you be by now? Where could you be by now? Let's see what is torn down that's stopping you from going. Let's see how many times you're on the basketball court when other people are studying their word. How can your ministry explode when you underfund it with your attention? <laughs> There's a reason I cannot play the piano like Marcus. I can play the piano. Frankly, I understand music theory better than him. I got fingers longer than him. My fingers are better for the keyboard than yours. The only reason you can outplay me is you invested more into it. You invested, you played, you rehearsed longer, you played longer, you worked longer. I hit it and got up, did something else. And everywhere the walls go down, everything gets out and everything gets in. He built his walls higher than mine. What key you in? Huh? A flat. a flat. You're in A flat. So if he's in A flat, I know exactly what chord he's playing. I know what makes an A flat triad. I know what makes an A flat fifth. I know what hit me, give me an A flat jazz seven. A jazz seven is a minor seven. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's a jazz seven. I know exactly what, give me an A flat augmented chord. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take me to D-flat if you, if you don't get out of it. But that's an A-flat augmented chord. I understand it intellectually. I understand it. I could teach it, but I can't do it because I didn't build the walls that it took to protect the gift. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Somebody ought to build that wall. Somebody ought to build that wall. Oh, the devil didn't hear you holler. Build that wall. What happened to the wall? Oh, Lord, I'm not going to finish. You keep feeding me while I'm standing here. What happened to the woman with the issue of blood? That she was young enough to still carry water, young enough to still be attractive and beautiful, and had five husbands and a situation. You know how you have a situation? All Jesus did was build her walls. The seventh man built her walls high enough that she didn't need the other six. <laughs> Wonder why God's got you listening at this message? Wonder what areas you need. We all got them. We all got them. We all got them. I was on the treadmill yesterday sweating and huffing and puffing all out of breath. We all got something we got to be working on. What wall do you need to build in order to accomplish your purpose? Nehemiah has assessed the walls. 
He's seen the damage, and then he starts the building process. And this is what I want you to understand. He built the wall in 52 days. 52, not 52 days, 52 weeks, I think it was. He, he built the wall so fast. No time at all, he had completely surrounded the city with walls. But that ain't the good part. He ended up staying there for 12 years. The good part is he built it out of burn stones. <laughs> I know your stones have been burned. I know you've been through some fires. I know you've seen the ruins of what you've been through and what happened to you. And I know the devil is trying to tell you that you cannot build a new wall out of old stones. But the devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. You can build a new wall out of burned stones. I want to talk to the people who messed up. I want to talk to the people who got secrets. I want to talk to the people who've had abortions and made mistakes and had affairs and have blown their time and don't have anything to show for it and still don't own anything and still don't have anything. I want to talk to the people who got better clothes than you got a house. I want to talk to the people who have better shoes than you have a car. I want to talk to the people who have burned stones. God wants to build a new wall out of burned stones. You say, well, I, if he built the wall out of stones, why did he get the wood? I'm glad you asked. He got the wood for the gates. The gates had been burned down. And there are certain things that once they're burned, you can't reuse them. Yeah. <laughs> If wood burns, it's over. You can't rebuild out of burnt wood. But all of you was not wood. You got something left. You got usable materials that still exist. And you have allowed all of these other nations to come in and affect you. when all you really needed to do was build back your walls. So Nehemiah climbs up on the wall and he starts rebuilding. He starts rebuilding. And the Lord said to me, this is a time of innovation. The season that we're going into now is a time of innovation. He says, in order for you to be productive in 2021 and 2022, you're going to have to build from burned stones. You're going to have to be innovative enough to assess what you've got left and go back to building, not crying, not lamenting, building, not dancing and worshiping, building. Remember, you can worship without walls. So you keep giving God more worship and yet you keep having more attack and you don't understand that worship does not replace walls. Yeah. Walls require your involvement. You must build back the walls. And the wood is for the gates. Now, the damage suggests that the gates are not repairable because they have burned down and they have to be built again. But the wall, he said, I think we could do something with this wall. Hey, 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 you, you, you listening at me right now. Do you still believe that you can do something with these walls? 
Because if you don't believe, cut me off right now. Ain't no need in me talking to somebody who don't believe that you can do something with this wall. I want to talk to somebody who believes that you can do something with this wall. Type it right in the comments. I believe I can do something with this wall. I know it's burned, but I believe I can do something with this wall. I believe I can do something with the second half of my life. And stop using your age as an excuse. Colonel Sanders was 65 when he started KFC. Bob Schaefer told me everything important that happened in his life, the American journalist, happened after 65. But you have talked yourself into dying, picking out plots. And if you're going to get through 2021 and 2022, and you're going to have to fight with one hand and build with the other, but God said if you put a sword in one hand and a trial in the other, everything that the enemy, that the enemy, that the enemy, that the enemy, that the enemy stole from you, God said. You're going to build it back. Somebody say, build that wall. Say, build that wall. Say, build that wall. Shout, build that wall. Fighting and building and fighting and building. Fighting and building and fighting and building. Fighting and building and fighting and building. Fighting and building. Fighting and building. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost talking to somebody right now. Hell is nervous right now. Witches are worried right now. Demons are distressed right now. Cause you got a sword in one hand and you got a trial in the other. And you gonna be ill? and you're going to fight, and you're going to fight, and you're going to build, and you're going to fight, and you're going to build, and you're going to build, and you're going to fight. Somebody out of, build that wall! So they couldn't stop him from building the wall. So they tried to distract him from building the wall. So they stood down at the bottom of the wall. Sanballat and Tobiah told him, Why do we, we want to talk to you. We want to talk to you. Now listen to this. This is very important. They are trying to seduce him into thinking that changing their mind is the victory. They want him to accept a false victory. You're not doing this to prove something to your ex-husband. You're not doing this to prove something to your sister. You're not doing this to get your mama to love you. You're not doing this for the Joneses across the street. All of those are distractions. It's false goal. It's false goal. It's false goal. And Nehemiah hollered by down said, why should the work cease? Why should I stop doing what I'm doing? I finally got up on this wall. I finally got a rhythm going. I'm finally fighting on one hand and building on the other hand, fighting on one hand and building on the other. And you're not going to break my rhythm. The devil wants to break your rhythm. But the devil is a liar. Let them say whatever they want to say. Let them say whatever they want to say. Let them talk about you. Let them write about you. Let them make fun of you. But don't break your rhythm. Hallelujah! Somebody shout hallelujah! What you are getting ready to build is absolutely amazing. It is going to fortify for generations. It is going to make a difference in the world. 
when you start living bigger than yourself, it is going to bring about a massive deliverance. And God is going to open up doors for you to have influence on a level that you never had it before. That's why I told you don't drop the mic. This is no time to get depressed and drop the mic. This is no time to walk away. This is no time to lose your voice. This is no time to give up on your dream. And this is no time to break your rhythm. <laughs> don't break it. The noise beneath you is always a distraction. The person who's hollering up at you, notice they didn't come up to have the conversation. They stayed down where they were and they're trying to call you down. I feel like I'm prophesying to somebody. I don't know who I'm prophesying to, but something is trying to call you down. You already been down. The reason you're on this wall is that you left down to get there. And now something out of your past wants to, hey, 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 come over here, hey. Come on, come on, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me talk to you for a minute. I want to talk to you a bit. I want to talk to you in it. I, I just want to, talk, I want to straighten this out. I, I, want to, I want to change this one. I want to say, no, 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 no. We don't have nothing to talk about because I got a rhythm. 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 And why should the work cease? God said, if you respond to them, you will do it at the expense of your mission. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So I don't know who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to you, wave at me. Yeah, yeah. Hit the wave button. Do something. Make some noise. If I'm talking right to you, yes, 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 yes. God wants you to live big. Live bigger than yourself. Live bigger than just getting by. Live bigger than just paying the bills. Live bigger than just filling your closet full of clothes. Live bigger than you. All that stuff is fine. As long as you can show me evidence that you did something for somebody that you gave something to somebody, that you prayed about something and invested in something that was not selfish, that you learn the art of service. Because if you serve, God will pay you. They didn't hear me, Oscar. If you serve, God will pay you. If you serve, God will pay you. If you just serve, God will pay you. If you serve, God will pay you. You're saying, if you pay me, God, I'll serve you. God says, if you serve me, I'll pay you. <laughs> God said, if you serve me, I'll pay you. As I come to a close of this message, I want you to understand something right now. I feel this thing. I feel this thing. I've always lived for something bigger than me. I always lived for something bigger than me. Bigger than myself, bigger than my own needs, bigger than my own drive. Oh yes, oh yes, I've been blessed. Oh yes, oh yes, I have been blessed. God has been good to me, but I didn't have to rip anybody off to get there. I didn't have to be selfish to get there. I didn't have to mistreat people to get there. I didn't have to rob anybody to get there. I live for something bigger than me. And he blessed me. Now this Wednesday night, 
I'm going to take this to the next level. And most of my Sunday morning people are not Wednesday night people. But Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, I want you to tune in, same station, same place you are right now, to our Bible class. Make room for it because I want to give you another dose of this. This is the first dose. The second dose is coming. The second dose is coming. The second dose is coming. We got to build that wall. Build that wall! It's coming because I won't stop until you really are living for something bigger than yourself. And I got to clear out some debris and I'm going to clear out some more Wednesday night. I'm going to clear it out of the way so that I can get you on the path to building the walls that will define you. The walls define you. They define you. Whenever you, you get ready to sell property, the first thing the realtor wants to see is a survey. Exactly where are the lines? I want you to draw some lines around you. A lines around your time, lines around your thoughts, lines around what you will allow yourself to entertain in your head. There were three nations on the other side of that wall who did not want those walls to go up. Identify the nations, people, places, or things in your life that are benefiting from your dysfunction. They don't want you better. They don't want you whole. They don't want you to know who you are. Nehemiah stayed there 12 years and became the governor of his people. From a cupbearer to a governor. He got there because he had as much integrity down low as he did up high. Integrity is boundaries. God, I preach good this morning. <laughs> I felt something when I spin around in a circle. I felt somebody uncomfortable because this message is chipping away at something you're into. When I spin around in a circle just then, God said, this message is chipping away into something you're into. As long as I preach about worship, you're good. As long as I preach about being blessed, you're good. As long as I preach about prosperity, you're good. But this particular message is chipping away at something you're into. And there's a fight going on in your spirit. Because you have justified your behavior because your needs weren't being met. And now I'm telling you to live bigger than yourself. I'm telling you it ain't about you. Whatever little license you made for yourself to stay in debt, to not pay people, to not be honest, to not be true, to not be whole, to not work, to not stand, to not build whatever little credentials you have. I didn't know my mother, I didn't know my father, I didn't grow up in the right neighborhood, I didn't finish school, whatever little degree you got in stupid, we're going to burn it. Because there are people who didn't have a mother or father who built nations and companies and businesses and churches. And there are people who were more abused than you, who went further than you. And I am going to burn your credentials for failure. And I know you're a little uncomfortable. And I know I'm cutting in kind of deep. 
but this is a surgery. If we are going to build with burned stones, then we got to scrape the char off the stones and get it down to what's solid. And I sense the Holy Spirit wooing you and I sense him pulling at you. And I sense him shaking your heart. And you're wrestling, try not, you're trying not to be emotional. But this wall is coming, this word is coming after you. 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 This word is coming. You know why the word is coming after you? Because you are somebody. Because you have potential. And because you're supposed to be somebody. And because you're not supposed to be running around with no walls. And you got too many enemies not to have walls. As I pray for you today, I pray that God would just touch you in a mighty way from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. As I pray for you today, I know it's going to be a process. It took many weeks to build the wall, but it was worth it. 52 weeks. You're not going to do it in 52 minutes, but brick by brick, we're going to start building walls. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, distance me from all of the rodents that have been climbing over the debris of my broken walls. I come to you, Lord. I understand that last thing I went to, it burned me. It broke me down. It hurt me really, really bad. And I stopped trying. And I stopped living. And I stopped breathing. And I just settled for whatever, whatever, whatever. But that old man from Dallas preached something that made me get my fight back. And I'm getting ready to build a new wall out of old stones. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the spirit of innovation and creativity to come in and take over as we begin to build the walls I'm going to rule my temper. I'm going to rule my tongue. I'm going to rule my depression. I'm going to rule my fear, my anxiety, my feeling of unworthiness. I'm going to rule my spirit. My biggest enemy is the enemy. And today, I'm going to build the walls. I'm going to put a brick Every time that thought comes to me, I'm going to put a brick right there. Every time that image or that feeling or that urge that says I'm a nothing and it doesn't matter, I'm going to put a brick right there. Brick by brick by brick, I build this wall. And I offer it to you. Let the work start today. Let it start right now. Let it start in this moment. A reconstructive message from the Lord has come to my life today. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed and you're still yet praying, I want particularly those of you who have been living with torn down walls to sow a seed in this atmosphere. To say, God, I heard you. I heard you. I'm not hiding, I heard you. I'm not lying, I heard you. I know my walls have been torn down and either in my moods or my finances or my behavior, stuff has been going in or out, but I heard you this morning. And I'm going to sow a seed as a sign that I accept the challenge I'm going to build that wall.
until I'm the man I was supposed to be, until I'm the woman I was created to be, until I'm the preacher I was meant to be, until I'm the deacon I was called to be. I'm going to build that wall until I start using my gifts again, my drawing. I've got art in me. I've got song in me. I've got music in my mouth. But because of my selfishness, I have not lived the way I should be living. But today I make a commitment. I am going to live bigger than me. As an act of unselfishness, I sacrifice this seed. In Jesus' name, amen. One more thing, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, if you're here and you've never given your life to him, bow your heads with me and say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. My life is in ruins. I have no walls. I have no stone. I have no brick. I have no block. I have no wood. Created me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit. I'm ready to serve you. Right now, I accept you into my life and into my heart. All around the world, wherever I have viewers, and there are thousands and thousands of people watching me right now, I want you to worship God. Out of your mouth, out of your mouth, I want you to open your mouth and worship God. I appreciate the comments, I appreciate the typing, but I want you to open your mouth, open, 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 open. There's something about speaking to a speaking God, word to word, spirit to spirit, air to air, pneuma, pneuma, air to air. Open your mouth and let God hear the breath of your words as you worship Him. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You can even lift your hands if you want. Oh! it around for me he's turning it around for me now as we close some of you have never had unselfishness demonstrated before you you grew up in an environment that taught you selfishness so you have to unlearn some things but it's your turn to set the standard for the next generation. Are you gonna repeat the mistakes of your elders? God is giving you influence. That's why I'm telling you, don't drop the mic. Don't mess this up. You can't mess this up. Cause we're gonna break some generational curses. And I have never asked you on a Sunday morning to follow me to a Wednesday night Bible class. But because you and I are working on this and we know one dose is not going to be enough, 
I want you to watch the Wednesday night Bible class. I want to add to what I'm laying the foundation on now. If God blesses you or blesses your friend or you and your girlfriends go in together and get one book, don't drop the mic. And we're going to keep building on it and we're going to keep building on it and we're going to keep building on it. You're going to learn a new language. You're going to learn how to speak in the direction that you're going in. You're going to learn who to say no to. You're going to learn how to deal with different things and you're going to understand why you have been positioned for purpose. I'm Bishop T.D. Jakes. I am the senior pastor of the Potter's House. I have not lost my vision, nor am I deaf to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. I want to thank you for watching this. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for giving me purpose and giving me life and giving me a reason to get out of the bed in the morning. You have done so much to enhance the value of my life. You are my bigger than me. You are my bigger than me. So I thank you for giving me a bigger than me because my bigger than me is you. Don't go nowhere. I need you as much as you need me. And together, we're gonna learn to live bigger than ourselves. I'll see you Wednesday night. God bless you. He's turning it around. It's turning around.